The Promised Neverland is one of the most popular anime from the winter 2019 season. It's also one of the more popular titles in Shonen Jump, currently releasing the magazine. And I wanted to find out why. To do this, I decided to compare how each version introduces the series and what kept the readers and viewers coming back for more. Both versions of The Promised Neverland use different methods of storytelling, but both are equally effective for different reasons. And I'm going to explain exactly what those are on this episode of First vs. First. The two philosophies that each version takes to tell the story are almost complete opposites. The anime takes you on a journey, smoothly traveling from point to point, but never really stopping to take in the scenery. The manga, on the other hand, can be seen almost as a photo album of the best parts of the trip. The anime takes a more linear approach to the story, whereas the manga is remembering past events as it tells them to you. This is an important detail, and I'll get to it shortly. The very first scene in the anime does a great job at introducing our main cast, Emma, Norman, and Ray, quickly and efficiently. It also plays around with some visual tricks of foreshadowing, specifically this shot of Ray behind the bars with the tunnel behind him. You wouldn't realize watching this for the first time that you're suddenly being told that Ray is a traitor and knows what's going on with the orphanage. This scene covers a two-page portion from about midway through the first chapter of the manga, and it allows them to use that same scene about the fence to make the viewer unsettled and to build the world, rather than simply a place to give a flashback of the main three's past. It helps to further cement into the viewer's head that this isn't a normal orphanage and something else is happening behind the scenes. The anime keeps dropping subtle hints about its secret until the reveal at the end of the episode. The beginning of the manga starts where the OP ends in the first episode. We are also introduced to our narrator of this story, Emma. Most of what she tells us is basic world building stuff, like the fact they live in an orphanage, their daily routine, and introductions to mom. However, there's one thing that she says that's off, but I love them all. I love mom. I love everyone. Even if we're not related by blood, they're my family. This orphanage was my home. And there was that key word. Throughout this entire passage, Emma is using the present form of the verbs. She loves mom. She loves them. This is her family. The first time she uses a past form of the verb is when talking about the orphanage as her home. This one line tells us that Emma has already experienced everything we're about to read, and is why I said that this manga is more looking back to the past and showing highlights rather than telling a strictly linear story. This storytelling also puts into context why certain things seem to fly by while others are given a couple pages to sit with us. Because the anime doesn't use a narrator, it explains why everything is given room to breathe and has equal time in the show. The two scenes that exemplify this the most are when they're taking the test and when they're playing tag. The tests last for five pages in the manga. Almost all of the dialogue from this scene comes from the computer where the test is being taken and the panels focus on the visuals of the questions being asked. Even Emma's narration has gone silent to accentuate this scene and give it this truly oppressive atmosphere and this makes a lot of sense. It's clear that she's focusing intently on the problems given, and she wouldn't remember much outside of what was sitting on the screen in front of her, especially when you only have nine seconds to answer its question. Of course, for the sake of the manga, it does stray to other characters focusing intently, but it wouldn't be too hard to infer what your friends look like when they're focusing. This scene is handled in the opposite way in the anime, as you can imagine from not having a narrator. Instead of focusing on the problems, it focuses on those taking the test. It gives the feeling of being in a different dimension from the previous happy breakfast scene. Many of the camera angles it uses are oppressive, and the lighting is harsh to further push this atmosphere. This is mostly shown by the camera hanging from the ceiling and each orphan being isolated by the light from their screens. The camera only cuts from this to show quick shots of the problems they're being given or close-ups of the harsh lighting from the computers, casting frightening shadows on the children's faces. Both versions of the scene create oppressive atmospheres, completely different from anything the series has shown yet, and it also foreshadows what's going to happen by the end of the chapter. This claustrophobic scene is heavily contrasted by what follows, but it still holds a thematic thread. 
The game of tag all the children play outside shows that they have plenty of room to roam about in the grounds around the main building of Gracefield House. Again, the perspectives from which the story is being told changes how much time is spent on the run from Norman in this game of tag. There are really only four pages of the actual chase in the manga, and it's only one game of tag. Time flies when you're having fun, and this is Emma's natural element. She's not meant to be cooped up inside taking tests all day. Instead, she'd rather be out and about, playing in the great outdoors. But this is also where we're shown that they're not really free. They're surrounded by a fence. It's a small fence, but it's a fence nonetheless, meant to keep them in and protect them from danger. This sentiment is awfully close to the reasoning shepherds have for keeping their flock together. When one sheep strays too far, they'll get bit by the wolf. And this rule of staying within the fence is one they blindly follow because of the trust they have in Mom. In the anime, they come across the gate during their second game, and Ray expresses his opinions about the gate. The major changes from the two versions come from character interactions. The anime shows more of the relationships that the characters have with each other, such as Don overconfidently helping Connie run from Norman. It also showcases some of the strategies, or lack thereof, some of the children implement in order to get away from Norman. The one scene in the manga that shows people getting tagged is very basic and could have been told by someone whether they saw it or not. Emma leaving out how she got tagged says a lot about her character. It shows that she has a lot of pride in her physical abilities and that she doesn't want to show weakness. However, neither version is without its flaws, and oddly enough, both of my issues revolve around Little Bunny. My main issue with the anime adaptation is one scene, but that scene is vital to everything that happens after in the entire narrative of The Promised Neverland. Before Connie is taken to the gate to be sent to her new family, she's saying goodbye to everyone at the door. She's standing with mom at the door in her clothes ready to leave and says, Connie only to then break down in tears, saying she doesn't want to go anymore, before the camera cuts to a shot of the door closing and the rest of the children standing in the empty entryway. The next time we see Connie, she's missing Little Bunny because she left him on a table in the dining room. If the anime hadn't been so insistent on not leaving anything out prior to this, we could have inferred that Connie had just set Little Bunny down to give everyone one last hug before she went to go meet her new family. However, even if the show had used similar exclusions prior, the framing of the scene still doesn't a lot for Connie leaving Little Bunny behind. The manga showing that she doesn't have Little Bunny when she's at the door, and having a couple panels show that they were all hugging each other makes it more believable that she would have left it behind. On the opposite side of this segment of the chapter, when Mom is shown to know that Little Bunny is there, it is simply handed to her by one of the demon monster things. It's done fairly unceremoniously too. The fact that mom knows someone was there is huge, and the fact that it was done so nonchalantly is kind of a bummer. The way the anime ends with mom holding little bunny with dark, menacing shadows covering most of her face is terrifying, and the music sting to silence gives me chills every time. Overall, both versions of The Promised Neverland are extremely solid, and I don't think that I can say that one is better than the other. Both versions kept me interested in the story, and the twist recontextualizes everything that you see on your first watch. However, the story's insistence on using twists as the main attraction from this point on was a detriment to the series as a whole. Now, this might be slightly outside of the scope of this video, but imagine the promised Neverland is a Jenga tower, and each block is a plot point. Now, if you were to pull a few blocks from the tower, it still remains relatively stable. However, the more you pull out, the weaker it gets until all structural integrity is lost and the tower comes crashing down. This is, in a sense, what happened to my trust by the end of the 12 episodes. The show had so many twists that by the last episode, I couldn't trust a single thing the show was saying. 
and this kind of killed the last major event for me. But I don't want to go too deep into those things as to leave this video as spoiler free as possible. On a final note, I will say that the beginning of The Promised Neverland created a world and characters that intrigued me and kept me wanting more. As I said earlier, neither first is better than the other, and it's honestly hard to compare when it sets out and achieves the same goal in a completely different way. If I had to choose though, I think I'd prefer the manga, and for the sole fact that Emma is a narrator. It opens so many opportunities for future storytelling, and I haven't read past the first volume, but I really hope that the story catches up to whatever Emma's doing right now. Okay, I gotta be really quiet because like all my roommates are asleep because it's like three in the morning. Anyways, editing through like this Promise Neverland has been great because like obviously everybody knows like the weird face, the weird face designs and stuff, like the really small face. Okay, everybody knows that, but like. My this this guy this this character that I just um, found while editing he's my new favorite. Look at this guy. Look at him. He's about to come. Oh! Look at him. Look at him, bro, bro. He looks like one of Jim Bay's experiments, dude. Like experiment six four five over here. What? Look at those eyes. They're, they look like Stitch's eyes. Bro. Bro.